Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Mike, and I'm a very mild alcoholic. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm real pleased to be here. Uh, Leesburg, Florida, the Central Florida Men's Workshop. I, I've never actually been to a men's workshop before, and uh, I'm sure I'm going to be educated. <laughs> Um. <laughs> Thank you. I got to tell you a little story about this. Y'all may not know, but they, they arrange for your speakers about a year in advance. And so last year I got a call. Well, actually, I didn't get a call. My wife took took a phone message, and so I get home, and she says, there's a fella named Tennessee who called, and he sounded really interesting. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but, you know, in, in our marriage, we have certain code words. <laughs> And when somebody calls for me that my wife describes as interesting, she usually means something along the lines of psychopath. <laughs> and so I return the call. And sure enough, he was really interesting. <laughs> And so, you know, he starts talking about the men's workshop. And, I, you know, I heard the meeting. I really didn't pay much attention to the men's part of it. And, 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 and my wife likes to come when I do things like this. And I say, you know, you know it's going to be all right if she comes and listens to the talk, right? And he goes, what part of men's workshop do you not understand? <laughs> I'd run across folks like him before, so I just said, okay. <laughs> I, I, I will be there. <clears throat> My home group is Tradition 3 in Montgomery, Alabama. We meet at 11 o'clock a.m. Monday through Friday. If you're ever in Montgomery, please stop by. We'd love to see you. My sponsor's name is Jim. And Jim is not here today, for which I am very grateful, because my story tends to be a lot more interesting when he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> However, there is a fellow in the audience who I just saw coming in here who is in treatment with me, who I haven't seen in a number of years, and that's going to screw me up. <laughs> but we'll try to get through it anyway. I'm a... I, I'm a physician. I'm a doctor. I practice internal medicine, uh, which is, for those of you who don't know, that's basically pediatrics for adults. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I am the medical director and have been for the last many years, actually, of uh, one of the larger state prisons in Alabama. And most of the people that I take care of have the same disease that I do. And I take care of a large number of people who are actively dying of complications of the same disease that I have. You know, this business of jails, institutions, and death is not theory to me. It's something that I live every day. I guess the main take-home message is, please do not drink and drive in Alabama. I mean, if, if none of the other potential complications deter you, think of the possibility that you might see me headed your way with a rubber glove in this hand and a tube of KY jelly in this hand. <laughs> I 
That wouldn't be a whole lot of fun for either one of us, I don't think. <laughs> and it's unfortunate, but uh, three or four times a year I'll be going to uh, you know AA meetings and see somebody who comes in and, and then disappears for two or three weeks and they reappear on the, the benches at, at my place of employment. That happens way too often. <sighs> I've really wanted to be here. I mean, I wanted to be here when I first got invited, because anybody who appeals to my vanity is just fine with me. But, but I really, really wanted to come here starting in October, because in October I got this nice little flyer for this meeting, and whoever put that flyer together ought to be proud. That, that, that's a nice flyer. I mean, it's slick, it's professional, it's, you know, it's attractive rather than promoting. And as soon as I read that flyer, I was seized with the almost uncontrollable urge to be here. Because I read, among the other things, it said, in big capital letters, there will be no smoking except in designated areas. And as soon as I read that, more than anything in the world, I wanted to be here so that I could smoke in a non-designated area. <laughs> I, I don't really know why I do that. <laughs> so if you happen to see me after this gig smoking in a non-designated area, it is not my fault. <laughs> the story I give is is going to be a little bit different tonight. Um, there's a section at the end that I that I don't give. I mean, I only gave it one other time, and the uh, the interesting person sitting over there heard it, and he wanted me to do that again. <clears throat> so instead of my usual opening, I'm going to start with the end. I'm going to start at the end of my story rather than the beginning of my story. <clears throat> I had been sober for a while, you know, and bought into the idea that I was an alcoholic and all, but there was something that just didn't quite fit <clears throat> until, you know, a few years ago I heard a guy speak and he nailed it for me. And what he said was, I didn't drink because I like being intoxicated. He said, I drank because I really, really did not like being sober. That nailed it for me. I did not like the way sober felt. And drinking was my solution. But my solution became my problem. And then I had no solution. And that's about as good a definition as I have ever heard of the bottom, the end. My solution became my problem, and I had no solution, and I was at the end. I'd like you to try to remember what the end was like for you. Not what was going on, but how it felt. Do you remember how it felt at the end. Do you remember that? Now I want you to imagine me. I'm sitting on a curb. It's cold. It's dark. I'm sitting in front of a building in a city that is not my home. And I've got in my jacket pocket a bottle of vodka. And what I'm doing is I'm unscrewing it and I'm putting it to my lips and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to swallow, but I can't. I've been drinking for several days and I can't drink anymore. It simply won't go down. And so I drool what's in my mouth back into the bottle because I don't want to waste any. I put the top on the bottle. I put the bottle back in my coat. I sit. I take the bottle out. I unscrew the top. 
I put the bottle to my mouth. I tip it back. I cannot swallow. But I can't stop trying. And I drool it back in the bottle and I put it in my coat and I sit and I take it out of my coat. I take the top off and I do the same thing again. I cannot stop trying. The pain was blinding. And at the same time, I felt nothing at all. Do you remember the end? That was the end. At that moment, I had been in AA for nearly 20 years. The building I was sitting in front of was about to become my fifth treatment center. And let me tell you, they don't send doctors to sissy 14 and 28 day treatment centers. You're a doctor, you go to treatment, you're put away for a very long time. They think doctors have control issues. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? They think, they think doctors often confuse themselves with God. <laughs> they even have a name for it. They call it M deity. I had been to four other treatment centers, the best of the best. I had gone into AA. I went to meetings, thousands, thousands of meetings. I got a sponsor. I tried to do the steps. I even tried sponsoring other people. And it would work for me for a while, for a while. And then it was like, a tiny leak in an inner tube. I'd come out all pumped up, throw myself into recovery. I would do the deal. I did the deal. But slowly and surely, the air would leak out. And I knew it was happening. And I'd even talk about it. And I'd go to more meetings. And I'd talk with my sponsor. And I'd do step work. And the air would leak out. And eventually the pain became... I never relapsed on purpose. I knew what would happen if I drank again. I knew I wouldn't be able to stop. I knew the consequences would pile up on me like wildfire. But there would come a point where even the idea that I might get a few minutes of relief from the way sobriety felt, it was worth it. During those 20 years, I probably drank maybe about a year total. But at no time during that span could I possibly, what I know now, have considered myself as sober. It was like living a life of fingernails on a chalkboard. And so I'm sitting in front of my fifth treatment center. My life is in flames. I'm not welcome in my home. I will never practice medicine again. And AA, the only thing, the only thing that helps us didn't help me. I didn't have no hope because I couldn't stop drinking. I had no, no hope because I could not tolerate sobriety. I had done the deal. But there was something that was missing. And by this time, I knew what that was. And it was what Bill Wilson calls the spiritual angle. I knew I didn't get that. I didn't come from a religious family. They weren't for religion or against it, but I had no religious training as, as a child. We didn't talk about banana prices in Brazil because we didn't care. 
We didn't talk about God for the same reason. And I'd sit in AA and they'd talk about God and spirituality and spiritual toolkit and spiritual principles and love and golden orbs and prayer. And I gotta tell you, this is what I this is what it was like for me. You wanna know how it felt for me being an AA when I'd hear this kind of stuff? I'm gonna tell you a joke. Okay. And I want you to take stock of how you feel right now. You know, bored, full, sleepy, you know, whatever. But just take stock of how you feel right this minute. I'm going to tell you a joke, and then I want you to compare that with how you feel after I tell the joke. Okay? I'll even tell you what the joke is about. The joke is about a drunken termite. Okay? It's a good joke. Listen close. Here it comes. A drunken termite goes wandering through the town, staggering through the streets. Goes up to the local tavern, bangs through the doors, roars into the middle of it, bangs his fist down on the table and yells, Where's the bartender? How do you feel right now? Because the joke is over. (laughs) Seriously, how do you feel? You feel kind of like, Ooh, shit, I think I just missed something. Are you feeling just a little bit dumb because there were a couple people who did laugh? <laughs> Are you feeling just a little bit hostile toward the guy who made you feel dumb? How do you feel right now? That's how I felt in AA. Oh, I'll explain the joke. <clears throat> Remember the joke's about a termite. Termites eat wood. The termite went into the bar and what he said was, where is the bar, the slab of wood that the drinks sit on, tender and tasty to eat? Where is the bar tender? (laughs) Oh, now it's funny. Because now you have the perspective of a termite. I was not a termite. You were talking about stuff and I didn't get the joke. Turn it over to God. What? Oh, you got to pray for your problems. Praying for the problems isn't going to pay my mortgage. It's not going to make my wife... <laughs> better. She was god awful sick at this point. <laughs> I gotta tell you. <clears throat> and the God thing. Like I said, I didn't grow up with any kind of religious training. The God thing. I'll tell you another story. This one's easier than the first one. I promise. <laughs> All right, let's say I'm walking down the road just minding my own business and around the corner comes a red Mustang and the red Mustang's going way too fast and kind of skids out of control and it clips me and over the hood, into the windshield, over the top, and there's a trunk, into the gutter I go and I'm hurt. I'm hurt bad. I've got broken things. I've got joints where there should not be any joints and I've got a geyser of red stuff coming out of my chest. I'm hurt. I'm hurt badly. And I cannot help myself. I'm dying. And I cannot help myself. I'm in the gutter. And I cannot help myself. I am really hurt. And along comes the ambulance. And they scoop me up. And they take me over to the hospital. And they take me into the emergency room. And they take me into the trauma room. And they put me on the table. And the nurses are poking in IVs. And they're hooking up the EKG leads. And they're shooting x-rays. And there's just chaos all around that is going on. And I'm sitting there, and there's this geyser of red stuff coming out of my chest, and I'm dying. I'm hurt badly, and I cannot help myself, and I'm dying. And in come into the room, into the midst of all this chaos comes the trauma surgeon. 
And he looks confident. He looks businesslike. A man who knows his business. And he steps in, the crowd parts, and he comes over to me and whispers in my ear, Mike, I can save your life. But first, you need to believe with all your heart in the Easter Bunny. I got real problems. My career is in flames. My wife hates me. My kids don't want to see me. I got financial problems. I got, I got problem problems. I mean, I, my life is down the toilet. And they're telling me that I need to believe in the Easter Bunny. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. And so I'm in my fifth treatment center. And I have no hope. If you believe nothing else when you leave this talk, please believe that. I had no hope. Not because I couldn't stop drinking. I couldn't do that. Not because it was because I wasn't going to be able to tolerate sobriety. And the best thing that could happen is I would go through the treatment and I'd go back to that life where it sounded like the fingernails constantly. I'd get up, go to work, come home, eat dinner, go to bed, get up, go home, eat dinner, go to bed. Round and around and around and around. And that was the best I could possibly hope for. And there was no hope there. None. I didn't get this spiritual thing. I was not a termite. Oh, and I knew it would happen. I'd do well in treatment. I'd let them take care of me until I could take care of myself. That's not a problem. And I'd start feeling physically better. And eventually I'd be sitting in a group and there'd be some little emotional breakdown and a couple of tears and everybody would say, oh, he's made a breakthrough and I'd feel much better. And, you know, and I'd go through the rest of it. And I'd come out feeling all pumped up and I'd go back home and I'd feel great. And I'd go back into AA and I knew the air would leak, would leak out of my tire again and I knew that was going to happen again. I had no hope. So there I am. I'm a month into treatment. I told you I was going to be there for a long time, so I was just getting started. And I went over to the guy who was running the outfit, and I said, Yule, his name was Yule, I said, Yule, you have lied to me. And he said, I have? He said, yeah. I said, what did I lie about? He said, I said, you said it would get better. I've been here a month, and it ain't gotten better. My wife still hates me. My kids still don't want to see me. I still don't have any money. I can't pay for this goddamn place. I'm in treatment. I'm going to come out. A is going to be exactly the same. You know, I still don't have my, I'll never practice medicine again. What's gotten better? And he looked at me. And he said, well, maybe. He said, but let me ask you a question. He said, when was the last time things got worse for you? Oh, I had to think about that. And the truth was that things really hadn't gotten any worse since the day I had gotten there. They hadn't gotten any better, but they hadn't gotten any worse either. And he said, don't you think not going backwards is a big step forward? And I hadn't really thought about that before, but he was right. Yeah, that was, that was a big step forward, not going backwards. And he said, what have you been doing here since you've been here? And I said, I haven't done anything except tell you the truth, which is, you can't help me. I will never want to stay sober. I won't be able to stay so get sober. AA doesn't work for me. I don't believe in the God thing. So you've been telling the truth. And I said, well, yeah, to the best of my ability, that is the truth, as I see it. So he said, so you've been honest. I said, yeah. <clears throat> and he said, isn't it interesting that the principle of the first step is honesty? We admitted 
that we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. A simple statement of honesty. And he said, as a tool, honesty very often won't make things better. He said, but it will always, always, always stop the downward spiral. It will arrest the avalanche. And he said, the principle of the first step, the tool that it teaches, is that kind of honesty. When I drink, I cannot stop. And when I do stop, I think about drinking. I am therefore an alcoholic. I may not approve of it. It is just the way it is. It's a statement of honesty. And I had one secret to protect and one secret only. And that was, I can't stop. And all of the other dishonesty and all of the other secrets, all of the other behavior arose from that secret. I can't stop. And I hurt the people who were closest to me because I had no choice because they were the biggest threats to find out my secret. And if they found out my secret, they would try to stop me because they love me. And so they are the people I needed to hurt first and worst. I had to. I had no choice. And the honesty, that's the way it is. Stop that process. It didn't fix it. It didn't improve it. But it stopped the downward spiral. And I thought, that's interesting. There's a step and a principle. I'd heard this principle stuff. Yeah, but, you know, it seemed to mean the same thing as the steps. So this was kind of in my head but it didn't really mean a whole lot but then a few days later I was in one of those groups and you know one of the counselor guys he read he read a line <clears throat> from the he claimed it was from the 12 and 12 and he said this is a line from the 12 and 12 and it says AA's 12 steps are a group of principles spiritual in their nature which, if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. I had never heard that line before. I raised my hand and I said, that is not in the 12 and 12. And he said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. I've read that, gun, that, that book. Sorry. A hundred times. I've re I can recite it backwards. I know that book. That is not in the 12 and 12. And he said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. And said, no, it's not. Uh, it is. <laughs> However, it's in the forward. Nobody reads the forward. <laughs> And so I was right. <laughs> but I started thinking, the 12 steps are a group of principles. Are, are the principles the same thing as the steps? And if they are, that sort of doesn't make much sense, but if they're different, what is the difference? What's the relationship between the steps and the principles? And I'd never thought of that before. And that was a huge, huge thing for me. I had been doing this for almost 20 years. There was very, very little that I had not heard in AA or in treatment. I'd never heard this. This was new. And when you're hopeless, that it's always going to be the same and never change. If you hear something new, it lights the tiniest of sparks. 
And so it's not that I had hope, but there was the possibility of hope just by giving me an idea that I had never heard before. And I said, how does that work with the rest of them? And they said, well, look at step two. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. They said, that's about hope. And I said, I could see this, but I got another question here. You know, they, they, these are termite words now. Uh, and they seem to throw away these, you know, these these words, the, the 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 belief and the hope and the faith. They seem to use them interchangeably. And in fact, I would go around asking people, "What does it mean to have faith?" And they would say, "It means you believe." And so I'd say, "Okay, what does it mean that you believe?" It means you got faith. Well, I'm sorry, you know, I was toxic, but I know circular logic when I hear it. That that really didn't help. And finally, the guy sat down and he said, look, it's a progression. If you say something that you did and that you experienced a certain result for having doing it, and I don't think that you're a pathological liar, I believe you. Okay, fine. You did it. You got the result. Great. Get out of my way. Belief. I hear what you say, but I'm not involved. I just choose to believe that you did something and you experienced the result of what you did. But if you say that thing in such a way that I start thinking, well, maybe I can do that too, that's hope. You say, you said a little what you call a prayer in the morning, you went to a meeting, you talked to another person in recovery, and you managed to stay sober that whole day. I think, well, that doesn't sound so hard. Maybe I can do that too. I haven't done it yet. I have not experienced the result. However, I'm beginning to be involved. You say it, I believe you. You say it in such a way that I start thinking, well, maybe I can do that too. I start, you have given me something. You have created something in me that didn't exist before. Hope. Now that was a really interesting idea to me because it meant that I could create something that maybe I didn't have. I could create this termite word called hope for myself. I could strengthen hope. And all I needed to do is to go to somebody who's having a problem, who had experienced a problem similar to what I was having, and ask them, what did you do? And then start to think, well, maybe I can do that too. I don't go to you asking, what should I do? I ask you, what did you do? And hopefully you'll say it in such a way that it doesn't sound too hard, and maybe I can do that too. And by doing that, I have created created hope. Hope always seemed to me to something that you either had or you didn't. But here, somebody's suggesting that through my actions, I can create hope. And then they said, look at the third step. Made a decision to turn my will and my wife life over to the care of God. They said, that's about faith. And that's the third part of the progression. You say you did something, you got a result. You say it in such a way, I start thinking, well, maybe I can do that too. Hope. When I do what you did and I experience the result for myself, that's the beginning of faith. Because if I do it again, and it works again, and I do it again, and it works again, and I do it again, and it works again, eventually I'm going to know that it will work the next time. And that's as rock solid a faith as you could possibly ask for. I will not drink today. I know that. That is a fact. And the reason I know that is I have done today the same thing I did yesterday and the day before and the day before. And it worked for me every one of those times. I know I will not drink tomorrow. I know that for a fact. For an absolute fact. Because I intend to do tomorrow what I did today. And it worked for me. What more solid? What more tangible? What more spiritual faith 
could you possibly ask for? This was a revelation to me. It meant that I could create hope. I could create faith. To create faith, all I needed to do is do what you did and experience the result for myself. And if I do it long enough, I will know for an absolute fact that it will work for me again. I have no doubt. And that's what faith is. I can create it. I can strengthen it. Every time I do today, every time I do what worked for me yesterday, I have increased my faith. Termite words. You know, they ask me, yeah, they ask me up to this point, Mike, do you have faith? I gotta say, no. Now they ask me, well, yes. Even me. Even Easter Bunny me could create, develop, nurture, strengthen this horribly termite-laden word, faith. My God, what an idea that was. And then they went on to four. Fearless and moral inventory. And they told me the principle of that step was courage. And they said, courage is not being unafraid. They said, courage is being scared, but managing to do the next right thing anyway, which is what fourth step is all about. I don't care. They're the only people who say that the fourth step is clear and straightforward are the people who have already done it. The instructions are not clear. And I don't know about you, but I went to school. The idea that the teacher was going to hand out a test where the instructions were not clear terrified me. i got to dig around through stuff I'd rather not dig around. And I've peeked ahead. I know I'm going to have to tell somebody else, you know. This admitting to yourself, that's crap. I was there. I already know what happened. (laughs) God, if there is one, he's omniscient. Presumably, he already knows. So the real clinker, the only clinker is I'm going to have to tell somebody else. I don't want to do that. Fourth step is all about fear. And developing the ability to walk through that fear and do the next right thing anyway, complete the fourth step, finish the last line. By which I can transform fear, which I'm ashamed of, into courage, which I can be proud of. And it feels the same. What an idea. My God. I can be courageous. I don't like going into meetings going, I've been afraid all day, which is usually the case. But I don't mind going into meetings going, I was courageous today, even though it felt the same. By doing the next right thing anyway, the skill taught to me by the fourth step, I can transform that which I am ashamed of, fear, into something that I can be proud of, courage. Fascinating to me. They also introduced to me the idea about this point that perhaps what they mean by spiritual is simply it changes how I feel. If I am honest in a situation versus not being honest in that situation, it changes how I feel. If I approach a situation with some hope that it's going to improve versus approaching the same situation with knowing that it's never going to get better, it changes how I feel. Hope changes how I feel. That's not theory. I've experienced that. When I go into a situation already knowing that what I'm going to do in that situation is going to work in a certain way versus I'm not real sure about the outcome of this, it changes how I feel. Faith changes how I feel. One way is more comfortable than the other. If at the end of the day I can assign myself bonus points because I was courageous versus shoot myself in the head because I was afraid all day, it changes how I feel. 
in ways that I've experienced. And they said maybe spirituality is an action that changes how I feel. By my actions, I can change how I feel. By spiritual actions. Being honest is a spiritual act because it changes how I feel. And I thought, that's fascinating. You mean I don't have to do this churchy stuff? Tell me more. Tell me more. And they told me the fifth step. Admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our own. They said that's about integrity. The ability to tell the truth about myself into the ears of another person. Gee, might that be useful? Relationships. Ho! The ability to tell the truth about myself into the ears of another person changes how I feel. Then they changed my life. They changed my life. Step six and seven. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. I was hung up on the word entirely. I'm in my fifth treatment center and I'm getting these new ideas. I'm starting to get a little excited that maybe something could change. I don't really think so, but it's possible. They're telling me some stuff I've never heard before. And here it says, entirely ready. Well, you know, the God thing aside, if somebody told me that I had a tumor in my lung, go to a doctor and he says, you got a little tumor there. It needs to come out. But it's not spread anywhere. All we need to do is go in there. It's pretty simple surgery. We just take it out and that'll be the end of it. Well, I may agree that this is a really good idea. But am I entirely ready? You know... The surgeon, he may be one of us who needs to be one of us. <laughs> there may be post-op complications. It might hurt. Am I entirely ready? No. And it was important to me to be entirely ready because that's what the steps said and I hadn't been able to stay sober and I really needed to do something different. And there's another thing, of course. I mean, besides that part, there's another thing. I'm going to tell you another little story. Let's say I have this yard. I'm real proud of my yard. I like my yard. I take good care of it. I mow it. I fertilize it. I trim it. I plant little bushes. I'm real proud of my yard. I like my yard. It's a nice yard. Over here, I've got a neighbor who has a dog. It's probably not a dog. It looks more like a mutated giraffe. Big. Big dog. <laughs> I can't say the words I usually say here. Big dog. And this big dog comes, gets out one day, comes over, squats down in the middle of my yard. My yard. Squats down and takes this enormous doggy dump right there. Big thing. Oh, I'm pissed. I am really pissed. Peeved. I'm really peeved. <laughs> It looks bad. It smells bad. It doesn't belong there. I want it gone. It's in the middle of my nice yard and it's making a mess of my my nice yard. I want it gone. I want it gone. It's got to be gone. I don't like the doggy dump. I don't like the doggy who made the doggy dump. I don't like the son of a bitch who owns the dog who made the doggy dump. (laughs) And I don't like the woman who married the son of a bitch who owns the dog who made the doggy dump. I want it gone. Well, I've got a neighbor over here, and he comes over, and he says, I couldn't help but notice the fine monument in the middle of your yard, Mike. (laughs) He says, I tell you what, I have a garden. I can use it for fertilizer. Give it to me. And I say, I'm sorry, that's mine. I don't know 
know why I do that either. I don't want you taking anything that's mine, even if I don't want it. Entirely ready? We think not. They changed my life with a piece of paper. Just plain old piece of paper. And what they did, for the benefit of the recording, is they tore just a hole in the middle of the piece of paper. And they said, Mike, where is the defect? Is right there. What kind of dumbass question was that? <laughs> they said, Mike, what makes that a defect? Is it because there's something bad that needs to be removed? Or is it that there's something there that's supposed to be there that's missing? Maybe a defect is not something wrong with me that needs to be surgically excised. Maybe a defect is something that I'm supposed to have that I don't have enough of. Maybe my defect is not that I'm a liar. Maybe my defect is that I don't have enough honesty. Maybe my defect is not that I'm afraid of tomorrow. Maybe my defect is that I don't have enough faith. Maybe my defect is not that I go around being afraid all the time. Maybe my defect is that I don't know enough about courage. Maybe my defect... Maybe what I need to be entirely ready for is to be given more. And I can do that. I've been able to ask for more since I was born. I already know how to do that. Please. I've been hurting so long. I have been hurting so long. Please give me more. Give me more honesty. Give me more faith. Give me more courage. Give me more hope. Give me more integrity. And the principle of the sixth step, give me more willingness. Please give me more. And for the first time in my life, I put my hands out and I said a prayer that I meant. Please, please give me more. And I was and I am entirely ready to be given more. Humbly ask him, not humbly as in small in the face of something large, humbly as it says in the 12 and 12, that for me, humility is a clear recognition of who and what I really am, followed by a sincere attempt to become all I could be. Give me more. Let's say I'm a can of red paint. And red paint is something I don't want to be. Red is bad. I want to be yellow. Yellow's good. But I'm not yellow. I'm red. Wish I may, wish I might. I am red. I don't want to be red. I want to be yellow. If I could find some way to add a single drop of something yellow in my can and mix it up today, what's going to happen? Nothing. Still red. Let's say tomorrow I find another way of adding another drop of yellow into my can. What's going to happen? Nothing. Still red. 
Let's say I do it the next day and the next day and the next day. Let's say I put it 30 days in a row. Let's say 60. Let's say 90. Let's say six months. Every single day adding one small drop of yellow into my can of red paint. What's going to happen? Well, I'm not yellow, but I'm not red anymore. There becomes a transformation. I'm orange. Orange ain't yellow, but orange ain't red. A clear recognition of who and what I am, followed by a sincere attempt to become all I could be. Give me more honesty. If I am just honest one time today in a situation where ordinarily I would not be, that is one drop of yellow stuff in my can. And if I do it long enough, if I keep putting one drop of yellow stuff in my can every single day, eventually I'm going to be indistinguishable from yellow. And yet, at that time, there will still be just as much red as there ever was. I can be what I am and still be in recovery at the same time. Being willing changes how I feel. A spiritual tool. Being humble, a clear recognition of what I really am. What am I capable of? And trying to become what I could be. Not should be, could be, could be. And I can do that. There's not one of those things that I can't do. Not one. Me. Godless Easter Bunny, me. Now look what's happening. I'm starting to speak a little bit of termite. Because now I have some idea of what faith and hope and honesty and integrity, they actually mean vague words, but through my actions I can change how I feel. Spiritual actions. That was cool. That was cool. Why didn't they tell me that before? They did, but I wasn't a termite. You said the words, I couldn't hear what you meant. That's what you were telling me all along. But I couldn't hear it. I wasn't a termite. Step eight, love. The principle of step eight. Made a list of all persons we had harmed. Became willing to make amends to them all. <laughs> At some point. <laughs> <laughs> love. And I said, well, you know, I can understand. There is a group of people who I have harmed. Who I do love. And I would like to repair those relationships. I love them. However, there is a second group of people far larger than the first, who deserved what I did to them. And, given the chance, I would do it to them again, today. I do not love them. And they asked me, Mike, how much do you love yourself? How much is it worth to you to get those people out of your head? How much is it worth to be able to see one of those people headed your way on the same sidewalk you are and not feel like you need to duck into the closest store? How much do you love yourself? And they gave me a wonderful definition for love, of what love was. And they said, Mike, you love, I love somebody if I am willing to wash their dirty socks. Now, that's not particularly romantic, but it's very clear. I mean, I watch the cute little thing walking down the road, and I'm thinking, well, am I in love? And I'm thinking, well, am I willing to wash your dirty socks? Uh, no. I'm interested in other things, but not that. <laughs> so it makes the difference between lust and love very clear, very clear. It also clarified some other things for me. I do not get along with my parents. I don't like them. They don't like me. However, if they need me, I will be there. I am more than willing to wash their dirty socks. I don't have to like somebody that I love. 
I hear people say, I love everybody in AA. I do not. (laughs) The miracle of it is that there are some that I do love. I am willing to wash their dirty socks. And I don't mind telling them that. Eighth step, love. Ninth step, discipline. Take the honesty, the hope, the faith, the courage, the willingness, the humility, the integrity, and the love. You put them all together, and I have the ability to make effective amends. The discipline to do that. That's why I was completely, (laughs) I completely failed in making my amends until I came to step nine. I didn't have the tools. The spiritual tools that allowed me to make the effective amends to set the book straight. Ten, perseverance. Continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admit it. And I said, there's nothing new in that step. You know, I learned how to do the inventory in four and five and, you know, the amends and all that kind of stuff. And they looked at me and they said, uh, when exactly was the last time that uh, you kept doing what worked for you? Ah, ah, I have gotten very good about digging myself out of holes. And I'd bust my butt to get sober. I'd bust my butt to try to stay sober. I'd bust my butt to try to look like I was staying sober. But as soon as the heat grew less, I didn't need to do all that stuff. And since there was no such thing as spirituality in the God stuff, it was all or nothing. And so I would stop doing what worked, and I would fall back in that pit of consequences. And then I'd dig myself out, and then I would go along doing just fine, and then I'd fall in the pit. It never occurred to me to keep doing what worked, so I didn't fall into the pit to begin with. It was a revelation to me. Perseverance. Ha ha. Step 11. Awareness. Awareness of things outside myself. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Awareness of things outside myself. Step 12. Service. That's the easy one. Having had a spiritual, spiritual, it changes how I feel. The spiritual experience, not experience, the spiritual awakening for me was coming to realize that through my actions I could change how I felt in such a way that I became more comfortable. And guess what alcohol did for me? Guess what alcohol did for me? It made sobriety tolerable. (laughs) Yeah. Sobriety was a lot more tolerable when I was drinking. (laughs) And here, they're telling me I can get the same thing with far fewer side effects. (laughs) Boy, I like that idea. I really like that idea. Carry this message. This message. What message? Well, you know, that depends on who you talk to. There's many opinions on that as people who read the book. You know, my opinion is this message is in italics in the big book, and it's also the title of one of the chapters. There is a solution. I think that's the message. You can't stop drinking. There is a solution. You can't stop feeling ashamed. There is a solution. You can't stop feeling angry. There is a solution. You can't stop feeling afraid. There is a solution. You can't stop feeling lonely. There is a solution. I believe this message is simply, there's a solution. In most of my talks, I kind of wind up here. But this last section, I've I've only actually done in this kind of forum one other time. And that happened to be the one that was listened to. Um, But I was asked to give it, and so I will. There was one other thing that happened to me. I had been uh, 
doing some uh, work with an individual who is teaching me um, meditation, formal meditation. And this is in the latter part of my treat, by the way. Um, so it wasn't like I was sober. Um, but in formal meditation, regardless of what happens, formal meditation really is simply, it, it, it's a focusing. You know, most, most formal meditations start with breathing. You become aware of things that you ordinarily are not aware of. So you focus on your breathing and you become aware of the respiration that we all do. We're all doing now, but not aware of it until I just said something. Um, you know, take a, a body part, become aware of your elbow, uh, that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's a way of focusing uh, is basically what it was. And so we had spent a number of sessions learning different techniques on how to focus down, focus it to a point. Uh, in this particular session, what he had asked me to do was I was supposed to bring in an object that represented to me somebody that I loved. I don't even remember what the object was, but you know, I brought it in, and this time he had me, you know, focus in on the object, and then he had me focus in on the feeling that the object represented, the love. Call it that. And then he asked me to do something that I'd never done before, and he asked me to come from that focused point and simply follow that feeling outward to see what happened. And so I did that. And to my surprise, I was able to do that. And there seemed to be a trail. And, and I can't really describe it any better than that. But I eventually came to a place where what I saw was simply, it was black, with a, a brightly lit slit, as if there was a doorway that was almost but not completely shut. And so, in my mind's eye, I went up to the slit and tried to look in. And all I could see was, again, description is hard, but a, a brightly lit but dirty white fog. You know, the kind that might drive in early in the morning. Um, but as I was doing this, there came on me, it was a, a feeling. It was, it was very, it was very, I won't say intense, but it was very much like the feeling, did any of you when you were little kids lean up against the, the hood of one of your parents' car as they kind of very slowly inched it forward and you're you know pushing back against the car? You know, there was this sense that there was a, a, a propelling force that was associated with this slit. And the feeling was... was was became very intense. And then I came out of the meditation and, and to my surprise I was crying. But I wasn't sad and I hadn't even noticed myself crying. And the guy that was working with me, he said, you touched something, didn't you? And I said, I gotta go. And I left. I don't know what I looked like that day, but I must have looked like something because people kept asking me, are you okay? And I really I say, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. The next morning when I woke up, let me back up, I have always had this obsession that I needed to feel better that it became, eventually, I need to drink. The obsession. It was like walking against the wind. Even in the years that I was not drinking, and in AA, and in supposedly good recovery, it always felt as if I were walking against a wind. Which meant that I could never stop and rest, because if I did, I would be blown backwards. Always. 
I had to walk against this wind. What I noticed the following morning, that was gone. I had never noticed that it was there until it was gone. It was like a piece of me that I had never really felt before. I really felt that it was gone. And I got to tell you, I started getting disturbed. I mean, I'm thinking, oh, shit. <clears throat> See, I'd, I'd read this Bill Wilson thing, you know, on the mountaintop and the wind wrestling through his ears and those kind of And, you know, and I'd heard other people talk about it and, you know. <clears throat> but I also work in a prison system. And I know about this, you know, come to jail, come to Jesus. <clears throat> you know, go to treatment, come to Jesus. And, you know, this whistling around the mountaintops and all that kind of stuff, it was just a load of crap. And if it did happen, it certainly wasn't going to happen to me. But I felt, and it's, it, it's so hard to describe how I felt. It might feel, let's say that you go to sleep in your own bed, in your own bed, you know, in your own house, and you get up the next morning and you walk out into your living room and the furniture is completely rearranged. Nothing is missing, but your furniture is not where you left it when you went to bed. How would you feel? Well, mostly, what the hell? Who did that? And my God, they might come back. It was not a happy, joyous, and free experience for me. It freaked me out because this didn't happen. And it wasn't going to, if it did, it wasn't going to be me. And I can't tell anybody about it because they're going to start thinking, jailhouse conversion. <laughs> so there's this war going on. Did it, did it not? No, it couldn't have. And there's this noise going on. But I didn't want to drink. And that had never happened. The wind had died down. The wind wasn't there. And I'm thinking, oh, you know, I'm a doc. I'm thinking, oh, post-acute withdrawal syndrome. <laughs> you know, this is not real. It's whatever it is, in two or three days, the other shoe is going to drop and it will be just like it was. Just, just, we're not going to talk about this. It's not real. But it didn't stop. <clears throat> Some of the noise died down in my head. And a couple of weeks later, I could, they, they released me temporarily from the treatment center so I could go visit. Uh, and I went to visit somebody in Augusta, Georgia. And Augusta, Georgia has a great big lake. And it has a great big lake because it has a great big dam. And so my friend and I, who's also in recovery, my friend and I, we were sitting at the bottom of the dam in a little gazebo that they had. And there was no one else there. It was a nice day, a spring day. It was quiet. You know, and they weren't generating any power. And there was no one else around. And we were just kind of sitting, enjoying this nice day. And all of a sudden, I could feel the water that was behind the dam. I was aware you would feel it too. I would have known if there had been no water behind that dam. If that dam was new and the lake had not filled, I would have known that there was no water behind it. I could feel the power. I could feel the weight. I could feel the potential force of millions and millions and millions of gallons of water. If that dam had split at that moment, I would have been brushed away like an insect. But it wasn't. It was there. I could feel it. 
And the hair on the back of my neck started to rise because it was the same, the same feeling that I had gotten two or three weeks before in that meditation session. It was the same feeling. I could feel the power of that water even though I couldn't see it behind that dam. I was aware of it. And I was aware of something else too. That I could climb to the top of that dam. And I could drink as much of that water as I wanted. I could even take some and I could put it in bottles. I could take it with me and I could go back down and go about my business. And from time to time when I got thirsty, I could drink that water. And when I ran out, I could go back. I could feel the power behind that dam. And I could go back. A couple of weeks after that, I'm back in the treatment center and they're trying to decide whether I should go home or not. And there was some question whether I needed to stay for a very long time. We were having relationship issues. And so I got with the treatment team. And I don't know why, but I told them what happened to me. I told them what I just told you. And I knew they would laugh at me. And I knew they would probably keep me for a very long time. And I knew that they would point and say, jailhouse conversion, oh my God, there's another one. But they didn't. They didn't say anything. Except at the very end, they didn't even have a discussion. The chairman of the committee simply looked at me and said, we think you can go home now. And so I went out and I sat down on that same curb. Very same curb. Only it was daylight. And it was warm. And I was going home. And I was sitting there with my head in my hands. And unbeknownst to me, a woman had followed me out. She was the director of the women's center which was not anything that we had to do but with, but she, I didn't even know her. I mean, I knew who she was, but she was part of the treatment team. And she came out to me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, Mike, I've never been able to put it into words like that, but I wanted you to know that's what happened to me. And I cried. And I cried. Oh God, it was real. It was real. It was... I don't know if it was real or not. But it was real to me. And from that moment until this moment, right here, right now, I have not had the breath even the wisp of the obsession. And what that did, it didn't take away anything except the obsession to drink. It didn't take away the fear. It didn't take away the anger. It didn't take away the shame. It didn't take away the loneliness. What I did is I went back home and I went to my sponsor, the pe- person, same person who had been trying to sponsor me all those years, and I sat down with him and I said, Max, I need to do the steps again. And this is how I need to do them. And I will be forever in that man's debt because all he did was look at me and say, <clears throat> Okay, Mike. People ask me one of the most common questions nowadays is how do I feel about the God thing? Well, I don't know if there's a God or not. There's plenty of people who are smarter and more dedicated than I ever have been. They don't know the answer either, as best I can tell. But I can tell you that when I conduct myself as if there is one, it changes how I feel. 
It is therefore a spiritual action. And part of spirituality as I practice it. I am grateful. Grateful to be a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and the spiritual program that it is. I'm going to leave you now. It's the last two things that I say every night. Every night after I've climbed into bed and somewhere between that that fuzzy zone between being awake and asleep, I say two things every night. It's part of spirituality to me. The first thing I say is thank you. Thank you very, very much for listening. And then I say good night. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.